Greetings and welcome to week four of the series, Growing Disciples. Today we're talking about uh, hospitality, and hospitality is such an important part of our lives as followers of Jesus. Yeah, I'm reminded of a quote. Uh, I actually got it from a pastor, but it, it originates with uh, Maya Angelou. Uh, and, sh and she said, uh, he said that she said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Now, as a pastor, a preacher, uh, sometimes this is a hard truth that, um, that people aren't going to remember what I said, but one of the things that has been a guiding principle uh, that came out of this for our church is that we want people to feel welcome as soon as they walk in the door, and we've kind of pushed that down, and this kind of puts some framework around that, that people may not remember what we say, but they certainly remember how we make them feel. And um, I'm reminded of a, a, an experience we have often in our house um, we don't eat fast food a lot, uh, but especially when we're traveling, um, we usually have to swing in and grab something on the way. And uh, for us, it's Chick-fil-A. Now, there's a couple of reasons why, uh, and the, the, the most important, I'll tell you, we are a family of six. And so um, we have six different orders. It's not like we can just go in and order everybody the same thing. And so it never fails. It's the busiest time of day. We order six different things, and the, the young man or the young lady behind the counter always looks at us and says, my pleasure. Mm. And I think, you got to be kidding me. But I honestly believe that. Like, the way that they treat us, the way that they make us feel, I mean, we're obviously there because it's an incredible chicken sandwich. If you've never had one, you should do, do that quickly. Get to it. Um, but the way that they make you feel, the way that they serve, um, your experience there is completely different than any other fast food joint. And so, uh, so they get our business because it matters how people make you feel. And we know that to be true. And that to me is the essence of hospitality. Yes, it's important that people know that they matter. Hospitality in the days of Jesus, and even today, is a key part of social life. In that day, your community was defined in terms of your in-group and your out-group. In-groups consist of your family, friends, people you work with, close neighbors, and as these people that you owe support, respect, and loyalty. It's to these people that you might give the shirt off your back or open your home to. You consider these persons to be your community and people to whom you owe hospitality, people that matter to you. Now, on the other hand, there are outgroups. All other persons, they simply don't matter. You don't owe them anything. They don't really matter to you and to your group. This is what it was like in ancient cultures. And it was like this with the ancient Greeks who had basically two groups of people, Greeks and barbarians, Greeks and everyone else. In ancient Israel, there's also two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles, Jews and everyone else. In both cases, the world and the social order is seen in terms of us, the people in your in-group, to whom you owe support, respect, and loyalty, and everyone else who does not matter. Lest we think this is a mindset of ancient peoples, we only have to look at the last century and the practice of Nazi Germany who saw the world in similar terms, the master race and then everyone else who did not matter. So we're speaking in human terms but God thinks differently about community and about hospitality and about who matters. Provisions were made in the Old Testament to show hospitality to not only your neighbors, your in-group, but also to the poor, the resident alien among you, the widows and the orphans, and even the traveler who happened upon you. God was saying to his people that the people you see as outsiders matter to God, and they need to matter to you too. God was building into the faith of his people, room for others. And he called his people to show hospitality, even to people who were not in your in-group. God, after all, loved not just one group of people called Israel. God also loved the whole world. From time to time, God's people had to be reminded of this. I think of the prophet Isaiah, who had a word from the Lord when Israel was returning from a 50-year period of exile after having been conquered by a foreign power and many people taken away in chains. God's word for them as they were about to go home said this to Israel. He said, it's, you're going home and I'm gonna rebuild and restore your lives and your nation. But that is a rather light thing, that's a minor thing. 
But here's the big picture. God told them, I'm giving you as a light to the nation so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. God has in mind that salvation and his redemption work is not just for Israel, it's for the whole world. Now fast forward to the Gospel of Luke, when the angels announce to the shepherds that they bring good news of great joy for all people, the whole world. Later in the New Testament letters, we see clearly that God has a heart and loves all people and welcomes all people and that all people matter. Ephesians 1 says it like this, with all wisdom and insight, God has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And then in chapter 2 of Ephesians, the writer speaks into the reality of the small but growing first century church made up of people who are from all kinds of people and how in Christ they have become one people. Describing what God has done in Jesus, it says, So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups, Jew and Gentile, into one, and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile, it goes on to say, both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility within it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who are far off, and peace to you who are near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God. We see in Jesus that God keeps blurring the lines to the boundaries we human beings try to draw that define our in-groups and our out-groups. We learn that we worship a God who is steeped in hospitality, who has a heart for all people, who makes space in his world for all people. And he calls us to remove our man-made boundaries and especially in the church to think not only in terms of what we need as God's people, but he also invites us to think in terms of how we can make room in our lives as a church body for those who have yet come to know Jesus so that those who are far off can be brought near by the blood of Christ. Thanks, John. Uh, I appreciate you, you know, explaining to us that you know when Jesus came, He really did open our eyes to see that the kingdom of God is meant for everyone. Uh, that you know Jesus really did um, live a life of hospitality in that He uh, expanded the gospel for all people, all people. And so um, sometimes, even still, though, uh, we struggle with, well, who who is everybody? And that's not just a new question for me or. Uh, John, you know, it's it's not a brand new question that we're asking. Um, it's an age-old question. In fact, Jesus himself was asked this question. In fact, let me read this to you. This is Luke chapter 10. Uh, we'll begin reading in verse 25. One day an expert in the religious law, so a, a religious leader, stood up to Jesus and asked him this question. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? What, uh, how do you read it? And so the man answered, well, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus replied, you're right. Now do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and I think this is the burning question that many of us struggle with, who is my neighbor? If I'm supposed to love God and love neighbor, who exactly is my neighbor? And so Jesus replied with a parable, with a story. And so I want to share that story with you now and hopefully help us all to realize um, who is our neighbor. So Jesus tells this parable, this story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side, of the road and passed him by. 
Now, the young man uh, who was beat up and left for dead on the side of the road was a Jewish man, as would have been the priest, uh, as well as the next person, a temple assistant or a Levite, the worship leader, if you will. So the temple assistant walked over, looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan, one of them, yes, a despised Samaritan, came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him, quite a different response than we saw in the priests and the worship leader. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine, bandaged them, and put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling the keeper, telling the innkeeper, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm in here. Then Jesus goes on to ask the question, now, now which one of these three, the Jewish leader or the, the priest, the Jewish worship leader, or the despised Samaritan, which one of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? The man replied, the religious leader who he's actually having a conversation with replies, well, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, yes. Now go and do the same. Now, I don't know what it would have been like to hear this story from Jesus if you are the Jewish leader. Because essentially, Jesus opens up the door to everyone. Jews and Samaritans did not G and haul. They did not get along. And yet Jesus said, it's very simple. When, when, when you obey the command of God to love God and to love neighbor, we must open the door to all people, both Jewish people and Samaritans. And so when it comes to our own lives, and we ask the question, whom should I extend hospitality to? Whom should I reach out to with the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus? Well, everyone. Well, thank you, Ben. That, that's a great story. And it reminds us that being a disciple of Jesus means that Jesus calls us as churches and as individuals to enlarge our in-groups. In very practical ways, this could mean how our church uh, sees our community in new in fresh ways, hoping to include others, making room in our lives for them. And personally, this could be as easy as getting to know a neighbor in your neighborhood you don't know, extending a hand of friendship to them. Or it could be in worship, sitting in a new place to meet new people. Or if you encounter someone that you don't know in worship, it's as easy as saying, hi, my name is John. I don't know you, what's your name? Let's have a cup of coffee together. Yeah, Very simple, but it's all about enlarging uh, our in-groups and including the people of, who, who matter to God. No, there was no one in Jesus' day that was exempt from his grace, and that's, that's the beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, hearing you say that reminds me kind of back where we started from uh, with, uh, with that quote that, you know, people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. And um, I was having a lunch uh, some time ago with... Uh, Larry Algren, he's a gentleman who joined our church, uh, actually joined a Sunday I wasn't even there. I, I decided to take the day off and have my appendix removed. Um, but, uh, but he joined our church, he and his wife Dusty. And, uh, and when I sat down and had lunch with him to talk about what it means to become a member of our church, um, he explained to me that you know his first Sunday there that my sermon was the best sermon he had ever heard. I'm only kidding. What he told me was, he said, when we showed up, we were kind of unsure about what was going on. We didn't know what to expect. But Charlotte Bailey uh, extended a, a, a hand of friendship to them. She welcomed them, and she made them feel like they belonged there. And since then, as they say, the rest is history. Uh, they, they kept coming back. And so um, even something as simple as uh, extending a, hand, a handshake to someone whom you don't know can might be the very thing that begins the, the, the conversation, that begins the relationship, that leads to who knows what. And so expand, expand your territory. Um, that is the beauty of the kingdom. There's enough grace for everyone, and we get the privilege of sharing that with all people.